Hi, this is Terry Peabody. I'm chairman of orthopedic surgery at Northwestern University. You're listening to Interview with a Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Terry Peabody, chair of orthopedic surgery at Northwestern. Doc, how are we doing today? Doing great, thanks. Doing great. Thanks for asking. It's a pleasure. Thank you for being with us. So let's get it started. Thinking back, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how those changed throughout your fellowship? So I think my goals were like everybody's. I wanted to be the best surgeon I could possibly be, uh, be competent and capable and responsible. Uh, my aspiration was to join three or four people who had taken care of me when I was a kid. I was, did my residency where I grew up and I was going to go into private practice with them and practice the way they had. So they did mostly sports and minor trauma and private practice. That was my goal as a resident and just to be good at that. So thinking about that fellowship year, you know, what was your mentality getting into the first job search and how that perspective changed the beginning years of your career? Well, again, I, I picked my specialty based on a job opportunity back home. Uh, so it was, again, a little bit baked in that I was going to go back and do this specialty at home, which was slightly unique for the people in town. Uh, so I talked to the chief uh, of orthopedics at the place I did my residency, and he said, uh, you know, I'd welcome you back. It was largely a, a program that was private practitioners. I could fit in. It would work well. Uh, so I already sort of had this especially training in mind just to go back and, and add something a little bit different uh, to the practice that I would join. Um, and I wasn't really all that sold on academics. I, I, well, I like teaching, but I didn't really recognize the value of teaching as an academic endeavor. Uh, I certainly was not going to be a big researcher or anything like that. Uh, but even as a fellow, I was offered some positions at some really high, I'd say high high standing academic institutions. I didn't even look at them. Uh, I really wasn't all that interested in that kind of job. I wanted to get home. I wanted to, I had a family that was growing. I wanted to make some money. I wanted to do some good things for people uh, and get on with my career and be like my role models who, uh, who ended up being my partners at the time. So with that transition, can you kind of take us through the journey on how you ended up being an academic chair? So yeah, that's, that's a tortured and weird one, but it's a lot like the rest of my life. So I um, got into private practice and also had a faculty appointment where I did my residency and I found myself on call every night of the week, working at five hospitals, two children and a wife who I was getting further and further away from and not happy. Um, I, I was operating and I was making good money, uh, but I was not very happy and I was never available uh, to my family. Uh, so I was very fortunate. My former mentor uh, in the Midwest called and said, hey, uh, I need a partner. I turned him down a couple times because I thought there was no way I was dragging my wife and family away from my home where they'd grown up as well. Uh, but eventually uh, spoke with my wife and she said, you know, if there's more time for you at home, uh, you ought to think about it. And that got me back into, I would say, real academics. Um, Enjoyed academic practice, never much in research, did a few papers, uh, but got more on the teaching side. And fortunately, I was at a place where teaching was really considered academic work, uh, where they valued teaching, moved my way up the ladder, became residency program director and fellowship program director, and ultimately replaced my mentor as chief of orthopedics at that hospital. Uh, and then was fortunate enough to make, become a chairman at another hospital, uh, again, based on most of what I learned through that time uh, in dealing with residents and attendings. So throughout that journey, what would you say were some of the keys of your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks in the academic world? Uh, a mentor. Uh, that was key. Uh, having somebody to really direct traffic and tell me what to pay attention to and what not to, uh, how to move ahead in society. So I got involved in my specialty society, uh, started out in committees, eventually led that group for a year. Uh, said yes to a lot of things that I ordinarily wouldn't have said yes to. Uh, gave talks, gave papers, looked at surveys. Uh, that got me into the American Orthopedic Association uh, leadership realm. Uh, and uh, we, we were fortunate to get the program directors together at an organization through that. Uh, so most of it's been, though, again, based on the mentorship I've had and the friendship with other leaders across the country and the networking that have been involved. But I couldn't have done anything, to be honest, without my wife and kids sort of supporting that 
and understanding when I'm not around or when I am around uh, what's going on. They, uh, I could not have done anything without the family. Now that you're the chair of the program, what advice do you have for chief residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? My advice is find something where your family, you will have family time, quality time, and not be so attracted by the money or the number of cases because that, that'll turn you a little sour. The other thing is be wary of your senior partners. Uh, I think you need to respect your senior partners, but don't imitate them. What worked for them 20 years ago does not work for you. And so I think you have to have a, a pretty good understanding of what you really want to do and what people around you want to do, the people closest to you, your family members who stood by you for at least, you know, however many years they've been through residency. Uh, you have to respect them and understand what, what they're going to need from you and that your job would allow you to do that. Um, and, and don't pretend to be anything that you're not. You know, do what you're good at. Don't try to do more than you're good at. Find a job that you can, you can settle in and understand that you can grow in that job and that you'll have mentorship or leaders around you who will support your career. I think that's pretty key. Um, I think a lot of people struggle with that when they come out. They find that they're just filled a job because there was a void in the group. You tend to get the worst problems and struggle through them on your own. And then you become dissatisfied and leave after two years. That really doesn't help anybody. Uh, you know, we want you, we want you to take a job and, and you know, work at least seven, eight years and then look around. We want you to help really finalize your sk skills and hone your skills. You know, that first two years, you, you really don't know what you want and nobody else knows what you want. And you're still struggling to figure out how you're going to do things. So on that mindset, you know, thinking back when you first got started in practice, what were some of the things that maybe you learned the hard way that looking back now, you would have given your younger self better advice on? So I said, I, I got to be honest, money was a tremendous narcotic. So <laughs> there, all of a sudden you made money for everything you did and not having a lot of money growing up or certainly in residency, that made, made me do things that otherwise I wouldn't have. So I would assist on hundreds of surgeries, even during times I normally wouldn't be working, took call at way too many places because getting cases and making money, that, it was amazing how much money you could make. What I found though, was I was not very happy. I was working all the time, but just not very happy. So again, it, it's so important to know what your family needs and what you're gonna want for your family time to figure that out. I'd say first, you know, you're not gonna get there working your way, uh, humping through cases. Uh, I, I see people do that in their careers and they're, they, unfortunately, by the time they retire, they're only as good as their last operation. You really want to develop more. You know, how are you paying back your community? What are you doing for others uh, behind you? How are you supporting that next generation? Those are important things um, as you develop through. I wish I understood all that better at the beginning. My impression from the outside was that my partners that I joined had it all down. They made good money, great lives. They were usually done by two or three in the afternoon and had seemingly no problems with patients. Well, that wasn't what I inherited. <laughs> so it was quite an awakening. So, and also as a chair, what type of questions do you get from your chiefs and your fellows when they're asking you for advice regarding that transition from resident to attending? Yeah, so I think I get a lot of cultural questions. So what's the culture of this practice? What's the nature of the practice? Um, again, uh, who's the leadership and, and how is it organized? And how am I going to fit here? Is this sort of a, um, like other occupations where you're going to bust it for a few years and then become a partner. And then does partnership pay off? What does it mean? What do you own? Uh, you know, in academics, we don't own imaging and therapy and at surgery centers, but that's very common in practice. You know, what's the ladder for that? How do you move into those positions? Probably nobody's given that to you in the first two years, but do you get it at three years? Do you get four years? When do you get opportunities to buy in or buy out of things? You know, what's the patient demand? Uh, what's your responsibility for caring for patients? Certainly, what's your call schedule? Are you going to be taking call for all the senior people in the group? 
Uh, and, you know, I found some things, some of my partners didn't carry malpractice insurance. They didn't tell me, you know, that puts you at certain liabilities. Uh, there were some other sort of hijinks in the office that I knew nothing about. You don't want to be involved in any of that stuff. So when I get asked questions, it's usually about what the character of the group is like, uh, what the nature of the group is. Do, they, do young people seem to do well in that group over time? And then lastly, thinking about too, is that you know, we're in this pandemic situation right now. And so all these conferences have really been done virtually right now. So what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process? Yeah, I think it's harder than ever. Uh, without national meetings, it's extremely difficult for everyone. It's hard for me to find candidates. It's hard to talk over a Zoom meeting and really understand what people are doing. But I think I think this group of residents really is challenged. And what they've got to do, hopefully, is set up networks, small groups, chat sessions, to really get the word out there and try to understand what practice is about. I think society has done a pretty good job, the academy and some others at putting together programming. Unfortunately, a lot of the people I deal with on a daily basis are not the best at practice management, right? Most of us academically know very little about practice management or paying malpractice or doing other sorts of things. What they really need are senior private practice orthopedic surgeons. The academy is probably the best source for that. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams. Thank you.